All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the 5 p.m. work session for the City Council. Uh, let the record reflect that all council members are present, with the exception of Chair Traberka, who will be joining us, and I think is just finishing up a meeting. We'll be here shortly. Um, first item on the agenda today is the uh, administrative update. Let me turn the time over to Mayor Brown. Thank you very much. Um... And I'll turn my mic on. I appreciate being here and the opportunity to present some updates from the administration. I'm going to start actually by inviting Gabe Johns up. He is our um, in the Treasury Department and um, will be talking to you about the lockbox update that I gave you a little bit of a um, preview of several weeks ago, but now we've got the plan in place and thought we'd go to the source. So Gabe, thank you for all the work you've done on it. And you're welcome. Tell us about the project. Sure. <clears throat> so as you, well, to give some background, uh, we do have a lockbox service that we use through Wells Fargo, our current bank, where our utility bills, um, when combined with our coupon, get sent to Seattle and are processed there automatically. And we've had a, a change in circumstances where um, we will be moving to a new bank shortly. And then also the usage on that lockbox has dropped sufficiently that we can process those payments in-house. And so um, those combination, that combination of events have come about so that um, starting November 1st, the utility bills that we issue will have this building's address as the return address, and those payments will begin to come here. We expect that transition just to get all of those payments cleared through is probably going to be several months in the making, but um, we anticipate that within three to six months we'll be completely transitioned and be able to close that down. Um, so as far as the marketing or the work that we're doing to inform residents of what's happening, um, the beginning with the November 1st bill and the following three weeks, we bill every week, um, there will be a highlighted envelope with some verbiage on it and then also an insert that explains the change and the information about what we're doing. Um, we will also have information in the Ogden Magazine in November, the utility newsletters for the At Your Service in November, December, and then on social media, and then also on the Ogden website. And so uh, trying to produce as much um, content as we can to inform people of what we're doing. And the good news is because we're doing this voluntarily, we're not under any kind of time constraint where we have to have this turned off by a given date. Um, and so we'll be monitoring the usage of that lockbox over the next couple of months. And then <clears throat> probably in February, if we have any users that are still sending payments to Seattle, we'll begin making or attempting to make direct contact with them to help them transition as well. Any questions? I can answer. I'll just pass around if you're interested. Um, the notice is in English and in Spanish, and then it's going to just have a the print on the envelope that will just say important notice and close because I just want to make sure that people read inside their utility bill when it comes so correct yep. and about how much are we saving um it's about fifteen thousand dollars a year and will we we will probably spend that in staff time though uh, we recording? don't anticipate that we will because we actually have um with other changes we've made we have the time and so we don't anticipate to consume any additional time it is really just a, we're dropping the service and we'll do it here Will we scan and, and then do that kind of service as well then, just to make sure that there's a backup? Uh, that, what do you mean by scan? Oh, I mean, that's what a lockbox does, right? They, they scan and yeah, so, it comes in. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so the way that our cashiering system works is when that coupon comes in, <clears throat> has a barcode on it um, that we can read just as the lockbox system does. And so we scan that, it brings up the bill automatically and then we apply the payment. Awesome. Yeah, so our, our function will be very similar to the way the lockbox actually functions. Great, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, you might've said this and I just maybe missed it. Is there, will there be a drop-off option if anybody wants to just come in and bring their, their bill in? Yes, so we do have a drop box at the Public Works building and, and that's been there for quite a while and that option will stay there. That'll be at the public work building, at the public building work. not this building. So if somebody Correct. brings it to this building, they'll just be redirected? Nope. Um, if somebody physically comes here, um, we have the capacity. Our cashiering system is unified, and so we can take payments of whatever kind at any location. And so okay. um, if somebody does, and we expect that people will, 
once they see the address is here, that they might come here physically. And if that's the case, we can process the payment here. Yep. Great. Well, thank you very much for working through that plan. I think it's really good customer service, increased customer service, more efficient. Um, and I just appreciate your thinking that through and yeah. getting getting that transition worked out. So yeah. if you yeah. have any uh, comments or if you hear anything from citizens um, as that notice is going out, please let me know and we'll work work it through. Absolutely. Is it something we can communicate through our channels as well? Sure. Um, yeah, we have, um, we can, we can certainly collaborate on and getting that through that, that Mike Bride that'll be working on our social media and through the website. So I'm sure, you know, Brandon, if you wouldn't, you know, you could just reach out and we'll just get all that so that you can make it seamless for your socials and anywhere else you want to put that um, notice. Good comment. Okay. Thank you very much, Gabe. Appreciate that. Great. I have a few other things I want to cover. I think um, these, uh, we've talked about um, Jack in the Box a few times. So I don't, you know, I think it's kind of working itself out, but just to, just to, um, we still, um, there have been some questions still about uh, whether there will be a um, Harrison Boulevard entryway. And, and um, just to clarify on that, that there was, there was never an approved entry point on Harrison Boulevard. Um, so we don't necessarily see that um, opening up. So I think the traffic pattern that was anticipated is off um, is just through their par their parking yeah, and area. Yeah, they have their own security guard out there now too. I noticed over okay. the last couple of weeks, I'm still there. Maybe just trying to get everybody used to that internal traffic pattern and directing people. They they still do have um, that one pod that is not part of their plan and. I don't know if they'll they'll come back to us, but we we do continue to consider that to be an ongoing violation, unfortunately, you know, unfortunately, but we'll see um, if if that that gets moved off of there. But otherwise, I think hopefully the um, the congestion is kind of leveled off a little. But if anybody has any other questions or concerns have, about have that, have we heard anything from like Hug Hess and those other businesses across the street? Uh, nothing that's reached my level at this point. So. Um, at this point, seems to I be think it seems smoother. to be leveling, right. leveling off. Um, also wanted to update you. I don't know if um, those of you in the north part, um, if you've heard about, we we had a planned water outage uh, on Saturday, and um, we actually the the water outage was was to accommodate a. Um, kind of a, a apartment project at the mouth of the canyon as well as a industrial use there on the on the north side of the canyon and um, we were not able to actually shut off the water so it, it um, there just it revealed that there there will be will be the city will be actually doing some repairs to make it easier to shut off the water in the future if we need to but we do need to do some um, valve replacement up there so um, that was actually that's fine that we were able to identify you know some some needs that we need to uh, change but we will be needing to actually do a water shut off to accommodate that work and it'll be before Thanksgiving we're really mindful of just trying to make that um, something that isn't a, hard, a hardship on the citizens but we will be putting out notice and I can try to get some uh, advanced information so that we can um, for your constituents in that area that will be affected, but we will we will need to do a day shut off uh, before Thanksgiving to um, help with some connections that need to be made up there. Um, but we um, we were were not able to to do that this past Saturday. Yeah, the, the, the people that asked me this is well, when was the water going to get shut off? I said, well, yeah. well, I know when it was supposed to, but I, mm -hmm. you know, so it, it just did not get shut off. Yeah, that's... it didn't get shut off as it, as it turns out. It was um, by the time, so our crews were out there and really by the time they were, they um, were thinking they could shut the water off. It was just too late for the work to get done that needed to get done. So we'll, I'll keep an eye on that and just try to find out a little bit more as that, um, 
when we might be anticipating that just so that we can we can give you a heads up earlier in the week is better for most people right if they're trying to cook or oh yeah <laughs> yeah so hopefully it won't be i feel like thanksgiving hey. is already coming up a little bit sooner than normal it's like too fast, fast. So, yeah. so we'll we'll try to find out a little bit more if we can anticipate when that shut off will be the earlier the better though i'm i'm wondering if there is a way we can uh let people sign up for for better communication, mm -hmm. um, you know, would have probably been nice to, to say, go ahead and wash your clothes because we're not going to shut your water mm -hmm. off um, and have it come up as a text or something. I don't know if we've got the ability to do that. Yeah, we do. And and actually, since you brought that up, um, Vice Chair Ritchie and uh, will be uh, hosting a meeting on notice in general that kind of stemmed from the prior conversation we had a couple of months ago about about the notice for you know zoning and and those uh, mm -hmm. you know sort of planning related uh, activities and we do have some tools that will that enable more targeted notice uh, through uh, through our systems that we 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 tend to balance wanting to use direct noticing for emergency purposes versus non emergency but where water is such a critical uh, mm -hmm. you know a critical. Uh, service that uh, we we could maybe use some of that also utilities we have email addresses for customers it's not um, we don't have them for all not everybody has signed up for email notifications through water but there are some targeted ways that we could do that other um, some of us might get the email because we've signed up for water shut off notices just through the city so any resident does have that option of of signing up for just citywide water shutoff notifications, but um, we certainly could look into doing that targeted noticing for this. Good. Thank you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a point of um, taking a look at that. And again, it just, it's just a balance um, of wanting to make sure that we're um, prudent with our use of those kinds of push out notifications. Yeah, I, I had reached out and was informed of a, an emergency alert that you can log in on the city. The city website and sign up and receive yeah receive those so yep so that's a way to do that voluntarily it, it seems like we could do and use social media a lot more with i mean there's a lot of people at facebook and and was it next door and those mm -hmm. kind of things um it seems like we can do a little bit more with that mm -hmm. yeah and my guess is that the shut off went out through those channels turn on did not so yeah so we, I, I mean we get them too. i mean i i see them in our next door apps or whatever yeah and the interesting thing about that particular notice so i I'd, I'd contacted our water division about that it was it was also overbroad which which um is is probably we didn't want we wanted to make sure that we were over notifying as well in terms of the area that was um, laid out there uh, just to make sure that people were over prepared if possible for the potential of an outage. And so we, uh, that's just another issue too. Some people might not actually get their water shut off when we do a notice, because we will be wanting to be over, over broad with, with that. And um, we don't want anybody to, um, you know, to not be prepared, but then to not be surprised if on the shoulder areas of a district, if they're not directly affected, they might still get their water. It's tricky how we word that. We have the EV charging stations going in and you notice that there's some landscaping changes. Um, we're doing water-wise landscaping in those uh, areas that you've seen the grasses coming down and right back here. Right? Mm -hmm, yeah, right in the municipal parking lot. But um, I think it will be it, it will be nice. It'll be similar to the kind of landscaping that was installed on 26 when we redid the road right there and being almost like our own little demonstration garden, but like the dem demonstration of the kind of water-wise landscaping that uh, residents could do, but we'll be we'll be putting that in. So you'll see that um, replacing what was there currently part of that work. And so last but not least, if anybody has, uh, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about 144 24th Street and where we are on that. Um, so it's um, what I want to emphasize- 24th is, or 25th Street? What, what's that? 25th, uh, 25th yeah. sorry, okay, 24th. 
145th Street. Um, we have followed the normal construction and plan review process in this situation. So which, which has been, uh, you know, a year and a half or, or more of, of going through. So until it gets to a process like we're in right now, which is a much more public process, you don't see a lot of the, the communications that are happening before between the city and, and the contractor and these, um, and just in a construction project you know, normal construction. So, but we have been, this has just gone through that normal construction and plan review process, which involves a lot of communication with the contractor. Um, it involves um, inspections and we've been, we've, um, some of the problem, uh, the, the issues that are there now uh, that, that, you know, we've had these two public uh, notice notice and order processes, but none of the items in those were new to either the city or to the developer. Um, it's a balance that our, our code enforcement takes between giving time to any developer of a project to fix uh, issues that are identified, discrepancies between the plans and the work that's being done. And then, and then if it comes to a point where we're just not seeing the work done, and then it has to be identified as a dangerous building. That's the point we're at. But, but uh, that's 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 something that we that it's kind of a, a normal process whenever you're looking at uh, plan discrepancies, as you do give the developer the the um, time to get some of those changes made. Um, May I ask a quick yeah. question about mm -hmm. that? Because I thought I heard, and maybe. I mean, I understand this correctly, but that the most recent um, inspection was by a third party or something. Yeah, that uh, the inspection that um, we are looking at. Well, so so yeah, there was a third party inspection that was hired by the um, the the contractor for the project that identified the current issues that that we pointed out. So again, that that goes back to. I just. Mm -hmm. confirmed it, what you had what we had already told them. yeah and and also um not new to to this developer that, that the problems were there and so that again we um uh we give them an opportunity and you know based on what their own inspector is is seeing that there are some items that needed to be resolved so um that that those items were not resolved um so that's why we did uh, when we were able to get back in there and this and just the city doesn't legally um, have like always have the right to just go back in. We, we need to make those appointments with a developer to plan for inspections. So when we got back in and realized that the situation had uh, deteriorated is when we sent out that most recent notice and order. And there is still some time. It's a process that still has some time that it needs to go through, but um, they do have um, under since that notice, which now has been maybe a week or week and a half, ten days or so, that that, that they have an opportunity to to do repairs if if they can, and otherwise, then you know, pursuant to that notice, in order we can move forward with additional steps up to and including demolition um, that's been laid out there. But that's kind of where we are, and it's again, there really aren't any surprises to. The city necessarily or to the developer it's just that there's there's a lot of communication that that happens in any normal process before it then becomes public additional questions or comments yeah i've, I've got one i it, are we certain that there's a live person watching that place yeah. that's an excellent point and the city is is actually um now um taking uh we're we're going to go forward and we're we're taking over firewatch there um and you're going to most likely see that building get hardened even more it's a decision that we've made so we are we are now um going to be taking that over and making sure that there's a live person and in, in fact there we have had our own security there since sunday i, I just drove around i uh, you know i mean i drove all the way around the block and mm -hmm. kind of looked at it pretty critically but just to see if there looked like anything mm -hmm. anybody was there and of course couldn't tell but um uh, another question and i i, I kind of want to be a little sensitive about how i ask this i guess but some of the people that have talked to me about that are 
because of the fiasco that this has become, they started to become suspicious of that other, the same developer's project over on 12th Street, whether that thing got away with a bunch of stuff. And do mm -hmm. we do we have any sense of that? Or I, I don't know. I don't know how to answer stuff like that to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll probably have to get back to you on the details of that project because um, we, it is the same owner and developer team and there had been a stop work order on that project as well that had been lifted and um i will have to get back to you on the details of where that project is thanks for the update <clears throat> what what's the updated timeline that we and the public can expect moving forward what's the timeline for the next steps and what's the decision point mm -hmm. of that next step and then what comes after mm -hmm. etc i think the the most certain time frame is that they had 60 days from the date of the notice in order to resolve that issue. And now I can't remember the exact date, but 60 days from that was times slipping by me, right? Was that 10 days ago or wherever they are now? But so that's the the next date. Um, and then it's possible, like it just it does take some time if if they uh you know if it if it it turns into more of a you know, contentious process or appeal that could take longer. So there's, but we'll just be keeping an eye on it as it goes through that process. But right now, your most important, I think, from uh, the perspective of, of the city is that we will be doing the in-person fire watch and we'll be hardening the structure, but there could be a long process. So before people see an immediate change on 25th Street, Okay. It could just, just take some time. Up, yeah. yeah, I was going to follow up too with it. Yeah. So what what was the purpose for the reset of the timeline? Was um, it so to, that we to, could add those items to yeah, the list? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there, it, and so the the both um, the first items are in there, but I think we we were able to get back into the property. So as I said, we knew of those issues, but um, when we were when we we were able to get back into the property and saw that they hadn't been resolved and felt that the that those that second set of issues, in fact, um, was was worse, and then had contributed to the determination that it was a dangerous building. Wanted to get those added into the order. Okay, are all of these timelines set in ordinance, or are there some that are statute too? Yeah, they're they're set into the city code. But is there anything in or in statute that limits our ability to, or is this only ordinance? There, it's definitely guided by state statute, and I couldn't tell you right now, but we're certainly following the state law parameters as well. Uh, there could okay. be an overlap. I just, I just don't know exactly. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I was just going to do a follow up. So, um, who um, takes on the responsibility of the cost for our security or additional things that we're doing to the mm -hmm. building right now? The city will be. Uh, taking on those costs, but we can lean those costs back onto the property. Well, I appreciate you all doing that. Mm -hmm. well, that helps me wrestle memories. That was my question, oh, wait, but sorry. a sorry. follow up <laughs> question to that is then what is the estimate cost do, and do we need to do a budget amendment, amendment right now? We'll, we'll let you know, we do have a, we had a existing contractor in place. So we're able to um, utilize a contractor that we use for security and other, you know, locations of the city already. So it was, we were able to do that. Um, and we can let you know, we'll certainly let you know if there's a need to, to do a budget opening to accommodate that. And I, I do have a follow-up question. Is there something that we need to be doing from a policy standpoint to, I think that's where you were going with that is to harden mm -hmm. the, the ordinance or. Yeah, I feel, I feel that actually our process, like that the existing process does work well, uh, it, and um, it it sometimes um, it it can be a little frustrating when you don't see change. I I can give an example of a project, a residential project, um, in my neighborhood that was actually under a stop work work order for many years, had a dangerous building notice, and the owner kept saying, you know, we're putting together the finances and. We did defer that several times, and now they finally did come together, and it's a beautiful, they remodeled the property, and they've done a beautiful job, and, you know, single family home. So, you know, I, I think that the process that we have works, and some it's kind of the balance that I was talking about is sometimes you have a property owner that that does 
get it done and and that you have to go through the dangerous building ordinance and um, sometimes we do have to demolish we do we do a number for every one that might get saved because they they need that time they get that time and they get the work done because they have to get the building permit um we we demolish several properties of course but um, sometimes it's a balance between the right of a property owner to to you know they, they get that time and they sometimes they come through they get the, the they actually do get you know, go go in and get the building permit and get it done. So, right now, I'm not aware of of any, but we'll certainly evaluate that with the city attorney and the code officials and ask them if because that would be something that we could bring to you. Um, right now, I haven't heard that our process isn't working. Did I hear you say that if if we have to do this and 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 demo it, do we we put a lien on on that property? That's, we do. Yeah, the abatement question. expenses will get leaned back to the property. Okay. Yeah, there are questions or comments. <clears throat> I I do have one other quick question. Okay. It's not related to the, the demo part of it or anything that's going on here. There's a lot of people that have asked how we how is it man how have we managed to build a building that is um uh two stories or three stories in the front two two three and four um how, how is that possible and maybe that's a question for barton or something um, uh, um my yeah and he's he is here my understanding is that project went through landmarks and it's it was permitted under our zoning ordinance for that for that district so we had we had made an adjustment to the height uh, a while back um, there was another project on 25th street that um, was i don't think it ever got to that level but the code had been modified to accommodate a, a prior project and so it was consistent with our current code and so there were were, were no exceptions that needed to be made it went through landmarks um, there was an architect that presented a number of times, a number, you know, like the landmarks kept going back, asking for changes. Um, I think it, it was a, it even might've been a couple of years, you know, before the landmarks commission, but it passed through that whole review process. Um, the architect plans were, were approved, stamped by an engineer, you know, so there, it was, it went through the normal process. As I as I said, all I've at all steps. Some, yeah, I've had some feedback about that too. And honestly, I I don't have a problem with the height because our downtown used to be taller. I mean, people are probably not thinking about the historical context of downtown and also the future plans for taller buildings in the mm. area too. So, yeah, I mean, people have asked me about it too. And yeah. Well, if we don't want to be a car centric place, we're gonna have to go up. <laughs> add some add some height down there, and I think it, there are some. I remember the landmarks. You know, they they would review what Twenty Fifth Street used to look like, and you know, some of the, the way historically there were some taller buildings in that part of town. Uh, they're probably they might if they're not on our. You can Google Google them, but you know, Twenty Fifth Street historically looked taller, and some of those buildings aren't here right now, but they are you know consistent with the. The character and the you know and they look at the the mass and the size and you know the historic character of 25th street so it looked a little different back then but it was taller historically well historically we were shorter too but mm -hmm. i'm shorter people <laughs> yeah that's funny but these are great questions and i really appreciate the opportunity to get your your input and to we appreciate you coming Provide. to give us an update. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Is there anything else anybody had? No, but I'm super excited that we have an EV station going in. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, that is exciting. How um, many are there? Uh, that fact, I wonder. Oh, three. Three. Awesome. Three. Are those double-sided or just three, 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 three places that you can plug right. in? Yeah, three places. And And by the way, the there this number of stalls it, it looks like we're losing some we're not you know they're not really losing that many to this project but but because of all the uh, electrical work that needed to be done the uh, blocking off that's occurred in the parking lot was more more spaces than will actually be needed for the charging so 
we're I know we're we're down a few spaces right now between the landscaping changes and the EV, but we'll we'll get back to a. And when is that supposed to be done? Do you know? Um, any I did, yeah don't know, but we'll we'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, soon I hope. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Christmas sure like village. everybody, will, oh yeah, Christmas Village is, is going up. I think that, that, I saw, the that's so exciting and the cottages are going out. So it's always, it is actually always a really nice time of year. I like coming into the office and the, the sun is actually rising and taking a photo of, of the trees with the lights going up. It looks really beautiful. So <laughs> if anybody wants to come down in the morning, it's always a beautiful time to see the the lights as well as in the evening, of course. But so yeah, grateful to the public works crew that's already out there um, getting ready for our our community tradition traditions. So, Anything yeah. else now? Nope, that's everything I have. Okay. Well thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thanks for starting the meeting without me. Couldn't get my office mates off the phone. Oh, we're very excited. We have Barton here. Um, Barton, would you like to come up and introduce your colleagues that are going to be talking to us about the Zone Ogden Unified Development Ordinance update? You can read it on your agenda. So I am excited to have the first of what we hope are several work sessions with the council to talk about this exciting project. It is a, a comprehensive update to our zoning subdivision, landmarks, and sign ordinances. Uh, for all that, those big long words, we've chosen to have a short word so the, the public can understand is Zone Ogden uh, to help market and to understand what the project is and to not use a lot of words. So. Um, so updating a code like this, it's both very exciting and very dull. It's uh, like remodeling a 1950s house. Uh, there are a lot of very dull stuff, you know, replacing the electricity, fixing the crack in the foundation and the hole in the roof and, and uh, bringing it up to energy code, which are not that exciting, but very important. But there are a lot of good opportunities that we have. It's like, should we add a deck? Should we open up the kitchen? Should we add lights and make it more livable? Do we want to plan for expanding our family and adding more room and those things? So there are a lot of exciting things. And we definitely want to bring the council along on that. This is a project that's going to involve a lot of uh, different parts of the city staff because what the the codes do, it touches so much, so many things that we do as a city. So uh, we're engaging with other departments. Um, for example, just the first part that will you'll actually see pretty soon is kind of a phase one update to our subdivision ordinance, which we've worked very closely with the engineering staff on that. And we'll have lots of uh, collaboration with other city departments on what we do. But we also want to engage the council um, so that uh, you're carried along and you understand where we're changing the plumbing and and also where we're trying to make decisions about, uh, you know, should we expand here? Should we change here? So uh, we want, we'll be scheduling some specific work sessions with the council, but we also want to also uh, provide you some other opportunities to engage during the process. We'll be providing some updates to you, some information items, and we'll be scheduling some times where we can just come and uh, we'll have an hour that you can come talk. And, and when you have ideas and things, uh, we want to be able to capture that and, and give you an opportunity before things get set in cement that you say, hey, you know, really, let's, let's add a family room here. And so we can uh, plan that out. So uh, so doing a project like this requires a lot of skills. It's kind of the plumbing skills and electrical skills and um, also the kind of visioning skills. And so we're really pleased to have uh, the firm of Logan Simpson on board. Uh, we've been very pleased with them and the planning commission has been very pleased with them. So we have two of the members of the team here tonight, uh, John Jansen and Delaney Silman, who will be making the presentation. So with that, I'll turn the time over to them. Welcome. I'm just making sure your mics are on for the people online. Thank you. There we go. 
Thank you, Barton. Um, thank you all for inviting us here to help you out as you go through this boring process of uh, exploring your zoning ordinance in depth. Um, as planners, we don't find that boring for some reason. It's kind of an odd thing. Um, so uh, just tell you a little bit about the process. Uh, what we're going to do tonight, uh, just going to talk about the project in general. Um, we have a first phase code assessment that we've gone through and uh, just really want you all to feel very comfortable asking any questions you've got or want to add something uh, topics wise that you think we're not involved in uh, and that we need to make make ourselves aware of. So please feel comfortable just asking away if there's something that comes to mind. So first, uh, first off, this is our project team, the faces you're going to see. Um, Jennifer Gardner, he, she is the uh, principal and she's the project manager. Um, she couldn't make it tonight. Uh, Logan Simpson does have a lot of other projects that they're involved in and sometimes uh, we have conflicts. So uh, there we go. There's some guy with a funny looking hat on under there, John Jansen. Um, Delaney uh, is with us here tonight, and uh, she and I are going to share the presentation. Um, over on the urban design area, Colin uh, is a firm that specializes in downtowns and uh, uh, more urban design oriented um, projects and they're with us as part of the team um is that christy no that's not that's michaela sorry uh old eyes um anyway uh, michaela is very helpful for uh our graphics and design of the code um one of the goals of this project is to get consistent graphics in there so that uh, it has a flavor that's fairly uniform uh, next there is Christy. Uh, she does a lot of outreach, uh, a lot of engagement projects, and um, uh, she is uh, going to do a presentation tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about that as we go along, uh, but she's helping us with uh, outreach. And then uh, Meg Ryan. Anybody met Meg Ryan? Not, not the actress. Okay. Um, Meg is uh, works with the league and does uh, moonlighting with us. Uh, she's done a lot of projects with me over the years and um, uh, really specializes in state law related issues. Okay, and just so you know, state law has changed a lot in the last 15 years. Uh, it seems like every year now it's hard to keep up essentially um, with the changes that come from the legislature. So uh, we'll get into a few of those as we go along. That's the Logan Simpson team. Um, we thought we might just talk a little bit about what is a unified development code. Um, John, who's on our team? Um, who from our side is our lead on this? Your lead you are or is it Barton yeah. and Brandon. I'm just making sure. And I do see Joe a lot. So there we go. <laughs> Anyhow, um, yeah, we're working closely. You know, we don't look at it as Logan Simpson just doing the work. It's a team effort to get through this. Uh, and just so you know, it's a couple of years. Uh, so uh, it's quite a process that we're going to go through. Uh, Unified Development Code. Um, I'm going to switch to closer up. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not reading that. Does that work from up here? Yep, it does. Good. Um, so just thinking about it, uh, you have your zoning code, uh, you have your subdivision ordinance, you have your sign code and your landmarks code. We're trying to bring all of those together into one unified development code. So instead of having separate titles for each of those, it's one title and those become chapters within that uh, overall ordinance. Um, it really has the ability to touch on an awful lot of different topics and uh, we've tried to list a bunch of those there. Um, obviously, since we're covering uh, the landmarks, we, we're going to get into historic preservation. Um, urban design, again, there's a lot of facets of the zoning ordinance that can influence what you see on the ground. 
uh, mobility? Are we trying to encourage more bikes? I think I heard you already say that, bikes and pedestrian activity, make a more walkable community. Uh, zoning ordinance does get involved in that. Uh, housing, um, read some articles about the city lately talking about housing. Um, we all know housing is a huge issue these days. Um, how does a zoning ordinance influence that? Well, it can uh, with more flexibility, uh, more diversity within that. And uh, that'll be something that'll be a conversation we're all gonna have as we go along here. Uh, what do your commercial nodes look like? What does downtown look like? Is there anything additional that we need to do? You've uh, updated your downtown ordinance just very recently. So uh, probably not a lot we're gonna do there, but maybe other nodes in the city, uh, we have some influence. Industrial development, um, you know, there are ways to improve the way the manufacturing areas look. Uh, what I've seen so far looks pretty good. So uh, still need a couple more tours though. Um, safety, uh, you know, lighting um, is an important thing. Uh, landscaping, we talked to, you all talked about xeriscaping a minute or two ago. Um, there also are philosophies for the police department for safe uh, landscaping to uh, uh, kind of enhance the way, uh, you know, people's living situations. Uh, sustainability, uh, big topic these days also. Uh, again, the zoning ordinance and the other ordinances can influence that quite a bit. Um, we do have a question for tomorrow night uh, that I think uh, should be an interesting one to see what your community thinks about uh, different aspects of sustainability. And then the last one, of course, is uh, making sure our neighborhoods are taken care of in all of this too. So um, all of that together becomes this unified development code that does reach out into an awful lot of topics. So any questions about that? I, I do have one. I, okay. I, I just, I'm seeing some of the things that I, that I hope we can address with our, uh, you know, the big bite process here. Um, one thing I've noticed for a long time is our mixed use ordinance just doesn't seem to work like it, it was intended to, to work. It's too complicated or it's too, I don't know what it is. It's too something. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, residential in areas that we wish we didn't have them uh, in commercial zones and C zones. Um, and, and so uh, I, I assume that, we, that this unified development is going to be able to, to take all of those kind of things and we're going to see what we can do about fixing them i guess this yeah. is the, the the best word yeah so we are going to go through every single ordinance okay so uh the mixed use one um we do have some issues that we have in the assessment which we're going to provide a link for you for, to look at that tonight um uh but those are the kinds of things that we need to talk through and make sure that we're coming out with a product that makes sense to y'all. Um, mixed use is struggling in a lot of places, for sure. Uh, you, you see the building that's got the commercial on the first floor and they're all vacant uh, spaces, right? Um, uh, some would argue that you need more density to make that happen uh, in, in a bigger area too, in a wider area. Uh, but it is something that we're going to have to talk about as we go along. Well, we're, I'm, I'm at least I'm hearing that people that would normally do a mixed use are saying, nah, it's, not, it's too complicated. They'd rather do a, a, an overlay zone than, a, than just use the mixed use. Okay. And you'll see here in a moment, one of our goals is simplification. Okay. Yeah. Um, because there are quite a few sections of the ordinances that seem like they're overly complicated, at least to me. So, and I don't know how Joe administers some of that stuff. So um, anyway, uh, just, we, we do need to have, to, we have to look through and try and look at uh, what could we simplify and make easier to happen for the things we wanna see happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, there may be some we don't wanna push quite as easy a job of getting through our process, but, uh, the ones that we want to see happen, we ought to make it fairly easy to, for that to happen. So, okay, I just thought to throw those things out because okay. I think those are pretty key for us. So, so those are <clears throat> those are good ones. Yep. 
you know, before you move on, I, I, I would like maybe you to step back a little bit and say, what's the difference between a unified development code plan and the general plan? Because I think we use those interchangeably a lot. Um, I, I, I'm not a planner, so, but I do hang around with a lot of planners. Um, and so um, maybe just quickly, if you could for our. Or, sure. Um, my, not ours. I, they, they all probably know this, but for my purposes, if you would. Well, I, I think it does get confusing sometimes. Uh, so I, I look at general plan as more of the vision for the community. Um, you're setting the um, guidance for what you're hoping to achieve over a 20, 30 year period. Um, and it's not an ordinance, okay, where it uh, you have to do exactly what that ordinance says. It's it's throwing out the ideas, it's throwing ways to accomplish those ideas, but you may not do all of them. And things change quite a bit in uh, the time frame of general plans. And uh, a lot of times there's new issues that show up that are just need to be addressed. Sometimes those are addressed in an ordinance, sometimes in a general plan update. I know you all are talking about doing a general plan update. Um, and we're trying to do this process in a way that the topical issues are addressed later on, all right, where you might already have some visioning that's happening in your general plan. And so we have some idea of where some of those issues are and where they ought to go. Uh, but the initial phases, and I'm starting to talk about pieces of this presentation that's okay but the initial phases are more the basics the ones that really don't need to change that really have a state law issue to them that we need to fix so ordinances it's kind of where the rubber meets the road and that's where the projects get processed general plan more of that long-run vision of how we want our community to look in the future okay okay let's let's try another one Okay, how about the steps? <laughs> um, we basically see ourselves going through here with you. Uh, first, we have the assessment step. Um, we're really uh, basically at the end of that. Um, we've gone through uh, the ordinances and read them all, okay? Uh, no little task. Um, I think I told Barton, uh, oh, I'll take about a month. Well, it took two, because <laughs> yeah, it was just more to it than I think we were expecting. So uh, we've done that. We've done some outreach, um, talked to a variety of stakeholders, and we have some information on that in a minute. Um, we've done a little bit of work sessions with you now and uh, with the Planning Commission. And you have a report that we have prepared that kind of goes through our general approach and I'll just say the approaches always are great, but as you go through the actual process, often that evolves a bit. Um, you know, you bring up an issue that we weren't aware of and we want to fix and get it uh, cleaned up. So we do have a process in there, but um, there may be things that shift a bit as we go through it. Uh, the second phase is the drafting actual text changes to these ordinances. So you're going to have the, all the state law things uh, taken care of, and we will present those. Um, and as Barton mentioned, uh, we're thinking that one thing we might try to do is provide to you some summaries of these text changes, chapter by chapter, maybe group a few together, and then have some sort of... Uh, planner on call time, whatever you want to call that, where you all could ask us some questions about that. So uh, that's not exactly up there, but that is something we're contemplating. Uh, work sessions, uh, open houses, like what we're doing tomorrow night, um, trying to get at topics that we need some input on. Uh, the last part is the adoption process. I uh, hope you're all aware that uh, Planning Commission has to have public hearings for all of this. You don't have to, okay? You can if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, so we have to go through that. We are uh, contracted to help out with the adoption process as we get toward the end of this. Questions about that? 
I don't know if you're going to go into it more, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about the community engagement piece, the listening sessions, et cetera. Yeah. We did, you know, and I know that this was probably planned well in advance, but we had a couple of people reach out because there's a mayoral debate tomorrow night also. So that's a little bit of a conflict. Obviously, I mean, those things are going to happen, but I'd love to hear more about what you plan okay. to do to engage the community. Yep. Uh, Delaney has a slide for that. Oh, perfect. Well, <laughs> I'm going to be jumping ahead. No, that's all right. I think it's only one or so, two away. So let me oh, understand. How about right here? So <laughs> you're not changing ordinances is what you're saying. You're just... You're, I would think that they would have to come to the council if the ordinance got changed. They do have to come to you, okay, for adoption. But you don't have to have a public hearing. Oh, sorry, I just didn't understand. What so you were um, maybe I should just didn't touch on that like real fast. Did. Yeah, real. It sounded real, like it didn't have to come to us if we didn't. It, it does. Yeah. Yep. Sorry to, if I implied that. Um, there's just a lately in the last oh five six years, there's just been a lot of conversation about public hearings versus public meetings, and um, the way the state law works, planning commission has to have a public hearing on a text change of any kind, but you all don't. You can have just a public meeting. It's just an item on your agenda, okay? And, and we should probably clarify that that will include public input and when, that's it, a, when it comes to us. It's a choice, which okay? Is, which is a choice, but yep. Yep. Some, people listening, some people listening to this might be thinking, oh, they're not gonna get any public input before they decide on this because of that le legal technical difference between a public hearing and a public, public meeting. meeting which yeah. would also allow for public input if we choose which yeah we usually depending do. on we what usually the do. council decides yeah. yeah i mean the theory of that is that the planning commission takes all those comments right and um and then makes their recommendation including those comments um so you don't have to do that but my experience has been most councils allow the public to comment anyway just saying you don't have to so okay um hey let's talk about what we learned <laughs> so, thanks john okay so as um john mentioned we've already been chatting with people including our uh listening sessions that we conducted a couple months back and then we've also had our website up and we've been receiving some form uh submissions and a couple of responses to an online questionnaire and generally what we've been hearing are these items and we will talk a little bit more about the open house a little bit later as well and kind of some of our future engagement efforts throughout the project so some major takeaways that we've heard so far are that the update really needs to improve the predictability reliability and the transparency of the code we've heard a couple of times that there are just some certain redundancies and things like that that make it a little bit challenging for people who are using the code um, to understand or to find which things apply to their application or whatever it may be. Um, we've also heard that it would be super helpful for there to be clear collaboration with engineering and public works and other departments, um, which is something that we want to prioritize throughout the project as well. Uh, we want to redefine where appropriate uh, administrative decision making authority so that we can reduce the number of public hearings for applications that are for uses by right. So making certain processes a little bit easier and more straightforward. And then we've also heard that we should improve legibility and organization generally. Uh, this might help us reduce poor submissions and generally make things a little bit easier on staff and, and users. And there are some specific revisions that people actually mentioned. So things related to multifamily, group dwellings came up a couple of times. And then of course the mixed use was something that we heard as well from people who are using the code or, or community members at large too. And we heard there was an interest in mixed use development generally, and we, heard a lot of love for the downtown area from community members and that this was that's the type of development that people really want to see um, and that they really love so that was something that we've heard we've heard that in our listening sessions and from all other kind of avenues of public engagement thus far and 
Other items listed here, landscaping came up quite a bit as well. That was something people are really interested in using landscaping requirements to conserve water wherever possible. And then we've also heard that uh, people are interested in making sure that there's a clearly defined intent and purpose for the ordinances. You know, we heard a couple of times that certain requirements seemed confusing to people or that they didn't necessarily understand why they would be required generally. So that's something we really want to incorporate into our revisions and our drafting as we go forward, um, because that's something we've heard from the community. So these are items that we heard from developers. We've heard them from city staff or from you know members of certain commissions. We had some people from several different commissions that were able to participate. And then, as I said, also the community at large, we've heard from several people just community members that were interested in the process in the process. So um, and a lot of these I think resonated a lot with the staff recommendations that were also made at the beginning of the project. And then several of our thoughts as we were reading through the code as well over the past couple of months. Do you have a sense of you know the response rate, like how many people responded and any demographics or anything about them? Yes, so we haven't been tracking demographics um, as of yet. Um, we can definitely work on that if that's something that we'd like to see. Um, we haven't been getting a ton of or a high response rate online yet. Um, and that's fairly consistent with a lot of our code projects, just because it's a little harder to get the community excited about um, code as opposed to a comprehensive plan or something of that nature. So um, that is something that we definitely can implement some demographics tracking too, if, if we'd like to see that. Okay, awesome. Any other questions about community engagement so far? Yeah, I've just had some feedback too, and I think you've probably had similar feedback of um, when you do engagement, if there's possibility of doing it not during work hours, mm -hmm. um, that would be awesome. Yeah, we, definitely. And, and I don't know what that is. I don't know. It seems like, is that six to nine? Is that something? So just, or maybe yeah. even on a Saturday. There's a variety of offerings, yeah. maybe that would hit that. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think too, I mean, in a lot of cases, um, I guess I have a concern. This is just the case way of the world right now right is like sort of over engaging i mean we we are this council is very interested in engaging you know as many stakeholders as possible but i think it is possible to that you know we are having like union station meetings we're having the zoning meeting we just had the who knows what other you know engagement meeting that we're asking people to come to so i guess i get a little bit worried about diminishing returns a little bit on how many people are engaging mm -hmm. of course there might be people that are more passionate about this topic than maybe they are about other things so maybe they'll show up for this but i'm just curious about any other kinds of efforts like going to other community groups rather than having people come to us yeah that's that's awesome we are so with the open house tomorrow we are piggybacking on the you make ogden event so um that is in the same spirit, I think, of kind of what you're saying of trying to make sure that we're utilizing some of those events that are already right. more embedded, which I think is absolutely a great approach um, to try to reduce just the number and the volume of, of things that are going on. Um, and yes, we do also throughout the um, scope of this project, we have nine community workshops or um, focus group type events that are are planned. Um, so those will be items that can be outside of you know work hours or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Do you sort of recruit specific people for those events, or how does that work? So there'll be a variety of of different types. So we can do like focus groups that are heavily, you know, centered on certain interest groups or whatever. If if that's um, the approach we'd like to take, or we can do more workshop, public workshop style events, like the one that we're doing tomorrow night as well. Let me just add to that, that uh, 
zoning is tough to get people to come out to yeah. let's face it <laughs> so um piggybacking on other events you're having whether that's a booth next summer or whatever it might yeah. be it we should have brought our shed along for the christmas uh, story <laughs> or whatever we're doing but uh I think the piggybacking is probably going to be the most beneficial for us um, unless we get into some controversial issues of some sort. Yeah. So, no, that sounds like the right approach. Yeah. yeah. So, and I guess the council isn't really the people that request that. It's more the staff, et cetera, that would be asking for it. But that's just an interesting, that's something that I would love to see is just a variety of different stakeholder groups and different times and places, et cetera, so that we can get the most broad spectrum as possible. Definitely. All right. So based on um, a lot of staff in uh, input, as well as our project team, and then also input from the public, we've built some guiding principles for the project. So these are items that we want to ensure are consistently coming through in all of our draft phases or all of our draft modules, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but we want to make sure that this is consistent throughout the entire unified development code. So we want to ensure that it is simple and consistent. Um, we want to modernize the standards. We want the code, we want to code what we want and not just what we have. Um, and that will definitely involve a lot of public input and input from you all and others. We want to make the right things easy and we want to balance flexibility and predictability. We want to engage the public as much as possible and we want to right size standards and procedures mm -hmm. and preserve what is great about Ogden. And we want to encourage sustainable development practices as much as possible and where appropriate. Um, and this, like I said, this list was built um, with a lot of staff involvement. And um, this is something I think we've heard very clearly through a lot of our engagement and then also thinking through the items that came up even in discussion today of just things that don't seem quite right in terms of things like the mixed use example that you brought up earlier of making sure that the right things are easy and that those items that um, that we can ensure that it's it makes sense. Um, so yeah, any and of course, any input on it, these guiding principles is welcome as well. How many ordinances do we have? Since it took you two months to read them. Uh, but generally, I don't, I don't have the number I can give you an estimate on pages. <laughs> How many pages? It's close to a couple thousand. Okay. Um, you know, the zoning one, uh, boy. You know, one way to do that is to take a look at that assessment that we've put together, and we do have every single chapter in there. So um, I just never counted how many we have. So sorry about that. No, that's, I just <laughs> wondered if you. <laughs> a lot, yeah. apparently. It is a lot, yes. That's probably the best answer, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and um, back to the assessment. So we will be talking through the assessment for the next several slides. And this is the general overview of the assessment report, which you guys will all get your hands on shortly. And we have the project overview. So covering a lot of things that we've just talked about, guiding principles and kind of the more specifics within the guiding principles. And then our public engagement as well. So we'll get a little bit more detailed about who came to the engagement event or the listening sessions and kind of who we've heard from and what they had to say more specifically. And then the general assessment is kind of our overall recommendations for the entire UDC or for all of the titles as we've gone through them. Um, and here again, it's the zoning regulations, outdoor signs, subdivisions, and landmarks. So generally what items we see throughout all of those titles that we'd like to address. And then the big picture um, as 
Yeah. The big picture thoughts on the zoning regulations and subdivision regulations. And then in our more focused review, we're going to talk about signs, landscaping, landmarks, and outdoor lighting, parking, and the downtown. So um, just a little bit of an overview of uh, what we found as we went through. Um, there are some options, I think, as we go through this, uh, and this may not pan out in the end, but uh, the idea of eliminating some chapters. Some of them seem kind of similar that might be something that could be combined. Um, the state law part, um, so it's just really something we have to do, <laughs> okay? Um, over the last 15 years, state law has changed considerably on a lot of different aspects of zoning, and they keep changing that. Um, but uh, the updates that we need to do, we just have to do those. Those are technical updates that need to be done. Um, and there are some conflicts with what we've got in the ordinance versus what state law allows you to, to do. So uh, we'll be going through that process. Uh, one of the principles state law has is uh, you don't really want to have vague language. Um, I'll give you an example of that real fast. That's in every or ordinance that I have ever gone through. Um, compatible with the neighborhood. Okay. We've been, we've been through that before. Okay. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean something different to you or you? Yes. Um, but those kinds of things we just need to clear up. Um, I've seen a few communities have made an attempt to actually quantify that by what's within 300 feet exactly and things like that. But um, nevertheless, it's something we need to clear up. And there's more than just neighborhood compatibility in there. Um, process decisions. We talked about one of those tonight. Um, there's a lot of them that we can get into and look at the options and decide what's best for Ogden. Um, consistent procedures. Um, uh, it does seem like that needs some simplification and clean, clearing up. Um, we kind of like to get into some tables for those procedures. And uh, recently, uh, even linking the process to your applications. Um, okay. Previously, we've had an awful lot of codes where every single bit that's in your application has to be in the ordinance. Eh, maybe today that's not true anymore. We may be able to just say, here's the link to the actual application. So uh, that might shorten the ordinance quite a bit. Um, so application types, uh, you know, um, who makes the decisions over each of those applications, that's all part of that process discussion, and uh, we need to get through that. Uh, Barton uh, is brought to us, and those that attended the APA conference maybe went to a session that this was discussed also. But um, the idea of uh, aggregating some of the applications together, such as simple ones at the start it off, and my example here would be like a sign sign ordinance application. Do you need to have a full blown huge process for that? Probably not. Um, a home on a lot, probably don't need that. So those could be what's called a type one. You may come up with a fancier name as we go through this, but something along that line. Um, type two becomes your more permitted use kind of things where you have a site plan required and you, know, you have to go through some kind of a review process to get through that. Uh, type three would be something that the planning commission could handle. Subdivisions basically these days are being handled by planning commission and staff. Uh, conditional uses, uh, another one. And um, those could be their own category, those couple, maybe there's some more. The more complicated ones, which would be your zone change applications, you know, if somebody applies for a rezone or change a zone, those kinds of things have to have a public hearing with the Planning Commission, can have a public meeting with you all, but you can do the input if you'd like to. Um, and anytime we're doing code amendments like this process, that involves the same kind of effort. So uh, you could have these different categories and try to place those in different tables and make that a little bit easier to understand. So uh, we're contemplating that. Uh, 
figures and tables. There's a lot of spots where I think uh, we need a diagram. Uh, Michaela would be involved in that. Uh, uh, some of the rest of the staff is good at that too. Not me, but uh, you know, that's uh, stuff that people do these days. It's really nice. And it's nice to have that kind of consistent look throughout all these ordinances. Um, right sizing the regulations. Uh, in a sense, we've really talked about that. It's really saying, are there items that you really want to see in this zone? You want to see that happen? Let's make sure that we can make that happen and make that fairly easy. Uh, chapter formats, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute um, and just generally reorganizing. So that that's an overview, okay? Uh, not very specific, just general things. So um, this is what we're tentatively thinking would be the table of contents in a sense, uh, the outline of this overview, this uh, UDC that we're talking about. So um, one more time, I'll say that this kind of stuff evolves in our process, but that's our first shot at it. Um, I can go through that or we just you want to just sort of ease through that. Just realize that there's a table of contents we're going to have to do and we're going to try and set it up this way. And the content of each of those chapters, try to set that up in an organized manner so that they're similar. Okay. I'm actually okay if you kind of go through that a little bit. Okay. I, I kind of, I'm kind of the, of that breed. Uh, okay. I like this kind of thing and, and want to understand so, that. So you're the coming basic. to our meeting tomorrow night. Well, yeah. I got a different thing I got to be to, but I'd love That's to. just one of seven. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that loves this. Yeah. Okay. Um, since that's easier for me to read over here, I'm going to turn around a little bit. But um, each of the chapters ought to have a first section that talks about the purpose. You know, what are you really trying to achieve? Okay. Um, uh, so if you look at that from the zoning district standpoint, we would have all the different districts, but each one would have a purpose in them. Um, talk about the uses, the overlay zones, that's all in one section, okay? So one chapter would cover all of that. Um, the re actual regulations, uh, you may have seen this in other codes, but uh, this will be easier once we simplify a little bit, but having all the uses by zone in a big table is nice. The table you would have right now would be like this. Uh, we hope we can get that down to some kind of manageable level. Yeah, but I know where to find things right now. So. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, the theory of this is it's going to be easier to find things. Okay. I know as users, it becomes... You'll be our designated tester of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So table of uses and then um what we're generally calling like all the setback and side yard sort of stuff uh front yard height um that's usually a spatial table so by zone you have the different things specified um accessory uses you know what do you do for the sheds and what do you do for oh i don't know maybe even the christmas tree lot that shows up on smith's grocery store that kind of thing. Those those would be covered in here. <clears throat> so standards. Um, yeah, I might that might be somewhat redundant there when I think about that. But how do you place the building on the, the lot? Those kinds of things. We'd have drawings on how that works. Um, and just the different standards that we would have potentially could be in that chapter, potentially could be in the one before too. So anyway. Uh, supplementary, so that's that's all. That's sort of your catch-all um, section. It would be items that really are uh, applicable to everything in the city. So fences and walls might be in there. Let's see if I had that listed. Nope. Yep, I do. Um, parking, your landscape chapter, which probably will be a pretty extensive chapter, given the the movement towards xeriscaping. You can also cover buffering in that chapter too what kind of uh, fences and walls and then landscaping next to those as we transition from uses to use. Um, lighting um, seems to be a pretty important topic. The dark sky discussion, you all had that yet? Yes, sort of, maybe we'll probably be getting into that. So- We just um, don't have lights. 
What's that? We just don't have lights. No lights at all. Then that chapter would be very short. Yeah. Um, I didn't notice that. Uh, driving That's around. right. Functioning okay. lights. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. So, um, so um, again, general application, sort of a chapter. Okay. Uh, signs, you already got one, but um, you do have other ordinances, other chapters that have a little section on signs and <laughs> Just going to pull those out of there and put them all in one place. Easy to find. Okay. That's key. Okay. Um, and we'll get into a few other things. Uh, uh, you know, iconic signs, uh, the vintage signs, how are we going to try and keep those around? Because uh, honestly, the, they do change out sometimes. Um, Nonconforming signs, those kinds of things would also be covered in there. Landmarks, uh, you seem to have a pretty good chapter on that, so, but that's going to be a chapter within. Okay, uh, subdivision, we talked a little bit about that. Barton mentioned a phase one. Uh, we're going to try and take care of the state law update first, okay, and then go into more detail later on, all right? So you're going to see that twice. Um, you need to do the state law stuff because the legislature put a due date on fixing what they wanted fixed um, by February 1st. So that'll be coming back to you pretty quick here. Um, but then eventually we're, oh, we're also going to take care of what I'll call low-hanging fruit in there. Um, just a few things that obviously are a problem, like you have an established lot size in the subdivision ordinance, which of course is different than what the different chapters of the zoning ordinance require. So we'll just get a few little odds and ends taken care of. Yeah, we'll get those out of the way. Um, but eventually we'll come back and um, uh, we are going to try and push a lot of the engineering standards that are in there over to engineering instead of in the zoning ordinance. So you don't have them in two places where you might have something in, that says something in engineering that's not the same as what you got in the subdivision ordinance. So we'll try and clear that up. Um, let's see, application procedures. I, I, uh, I assume those things will be referenced in that chapter that you go look here for the detail. So as opposed to trying to list how you do curb and gutter mm -hmm. in the subdivision ordinance, we would have a reference to the uh, engineering, and I don't remember the name right now, standards. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Okay, so it's not going to be someplace else that somebody's going to have to scratch their head to figure out how to find it. That's that's the thing that I would probably worry about is it's it's obscure somehow. Okay. Um, honestly, haven't looked yet at your engineering standards. Uh, not really part of our scope, but it it's also something that we're going to be saying, hey, you guys, uh, you need to take this out of here and make sure it's the, what you want in your engineering standards. Yeah. And instead of it being potentially in two places and those being in conflict in some manner. Well, I get taken out in the conflict. I just don't want to make it harder to, to get the whole picture. That's, yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. And I, and I understand that. So the, the whole picture thought, at least from our way of thinking, is that that ought to all be in the engineering standards. So when you have a curb and gutter question, you go there, not to the subdivision ordinance. Okay. But we'll have that reference in there. Okay. All right. That kind of makes sense to me too, although I'm not an expert in this area whatsoever, but it makes sense because engineering standards might update on their own based on a variety of factors. Yeah. And we always, you don't want to have to go change the subdivision thing at the same time. And Oh, I, yeah, I, I, I see there's, yeah. there's some wisdom here. I just yeah. wanted to make sure that, I mean, the average citizen that's trying to do a little project. Um, well, Okay, it says I got to follow some standard that I can't find. Well, maybe a link. You know, maybe there could be a link. That's what I'm saying. As yeah. long as there's a link or some some uh, obvious way to find that yeah. standard, that's going to be fine. Yeah, I hear you definitely. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, it's interesting that uh, state law changed for the engineering standards too. They <laughs> they have to have a public hearing on changing their standards too. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just so you're aware, you're probably going to see that come along somewhere in this process too, I would guess. So um, procedures in general, um, again, 
we're going to go through that together and uh, wade through how to best process uh, the different kinds of applications. So we'll get there. But that uh, could be its own chapter <laughs> also, because there's a lot of processes there. Definitions. Um, uh, you know, as we go along, we're going to be gathering definitions that are missing. Okay. Um, and we're also going to be modifying definitions that you've got, because a lot of times you've got standards in your definitions. And we want definitions to be just definitions and standards in the right chapter. Okay. So that's, that's a job toward the end. Um, but it's an important one as we go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. That may have been more than you wanted. No, well, no, I'm I'm kind of wonk about stuff like this. I, I'm not. I'm certainly not an expert, but uh, um, I had a thought came and it went. But. This sounds awesome to me, and I'm not in the same group as him. But I'm like, this sounds like a wonderful process. Yeah, it really you. does. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I guess. Oh, I know what it was. Um, you know, our our current zoning ordinance, they they always evolve. They always and, and they and the reason that they get the way they get kind of convoluted is because there's a maybe there isn't a standard for it, you know. And and so as you deal with something, well, you deal with it here, and then you got to change an ordinance over there, and, and eventually it just kind of gets messed up. Um, and I, I'm kind of wondering if, if if this can be somewhat, and it looks like it probably can, but I, if you can talk about it a little bit self-regulating so it won't get so goofed up over time as things change and change and move and need to you know I, so that you, makes sense uh, it does although i'm not really sure how we can guarantee you won't goof up in the future <laughs> once they're yes. done they're done they got it. <laughs> yeah well i'll just add just things like putting all things in a table tells you right now that okay, in this zone, we need to have a height standard or we need to have a setback standard. And, and you know if that box is missing, you know if you're changing that box. And so that helps it be consistent over time. Mm. Yeah, the That's uniform the look to everything is going to help you. You know, doing the tables does allow that comparison too. Does that still make sense? All these different ones that we've got. Um, and I'll go back. I, I missed my one joke of the day. Um, go back to definitions, and we probably will eliminate pigeon racing from the ordinances. <laughs> so anyway, sorry, Meg looked at that, and she said, gee, I haven't seen that for 25 years. Yes. <laughs> so, so we could have pigeons, but not chickens. <laughs> Just pigeons. Chickens are popular these and days. I, have, I, I confess I have seen at least three goats in our city recently, so... Yeah. Yeah. We said once we allowed chicken, they would open the floodgates. So it happened. Yeah. Okay. That's a lot. And uh, that actually covers some of the other stuff that we were going to cover. He want hey. more. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to get more. It's just going to take a little while. Uh, yeah. So just some examples of some of the tables and the graphics that you might see. Um, you know, you see a table there that talks about process. Uh, how you go through a development plan process. These are from other communities, obviously. Some graphics, uh, buffering, how do you do some buffering and signs, all those kinds of things would be items that we would be wanting to add in so that there's more clarity, uh, visual clarity, especially. So, okay. Um, I'm just gonna lightly touch on this because we did already. Um, let's see if there's anything I'm missing. Oh, we do have, so um, the state law thing, and I didn't really describe what that is, but essentially the legislature wanted communities to make it easy to build single family detached housing subdivisions, duplex subdivisions and twin home subdivisions, okay? So they basically have come up with a different process um, it's not that different from what you all have been doing, but it is slightly different and it has uh, timelines in it. It has a definition of uh, our term via Barton is limited residential subdivisions. Okay, so I'll just say sort of easy ones. Uh, they want us to push that through the process as quickly as possible. 
Um, they eliminated city council from having final says on final plats. Um, it's really a planning commission function and a staff function to get it done and recorded. So uh, that's, that's in here. That's going to be that first part that we're going to look at, okay, in the next month or two. Or three at the most. It's gone through planning commission and it'll be to the city council. Soon. Oh, okay. I'm, that's a, I'm not keeping that's up. State law, the state legislature did that one? They did. Okay. Um, they didn't address commercial manufacturing, multifamily, sensitive land areas, which wouldn't be easier, you know, those kinds of subdivisions. But uh, for your basic ones, they want us to be able to zip on through. So uh, as long as they're zoned for what they're zoned for. So this would assume you already have the zone. OK, and then you're coming in for the subdivision in that zone. Yep. OK. Um, subdivisions being administrative is the right thing they're yeah. trying to say. So um, eventually we'll look at the process some more. Um, I think we pretty much talked about all these, actually. <laughs> So, um, oh, bonding, I'll just really mention that for one second. A couple of years ago, the legislature took out the bonding for private property. So if you were requiring a bond for landscaping on a commercial development, you no longer can do that. You can only do public infrastructure. So that could be the park strip, but beyond that, you really can't. So. Right. That's a change, um, and that's one another one that we don't have any real choice on, okay? So um, just mention that, and there are some redundancies there, and okay, um, still got one more slide. Uh, and some of these we talked about as we went through. So um, uh, standards, just trying to make this more manageable as we go through. Uh, talked about vague and discretionary language. Some of that needs to slide out of there. Uh, more consistent standards when we get to these tables, that'll help us look at all that. Uh, these are the possibilities for consolidating that we saw on the chapters that may or may not hold as we go through, but it was just the thought as we went through it. Um, uh, there is another state law conflict with a lot of your uh, residential zones have an awful lot of historic standards in them, okay, which are fine for historic districts. They're not fine for everything else beyond that. And we're gonna have to go through that conversation also. Um, state law a couple of years ago changed again and said, we're only gonna let you play with this stuff, not everything. Um, and I, I really found it very disappointing. <laughs> I'll just say that when, uh, when I looked at your ordinances, I went, gosh, these folks, they want to do all these things. And the state's saying, you can't. So Can anyway, ask that a question about that one. Yeah, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time on that eventually. So, yeah. Well, we've got, we got one neighborhood in, in Ogden that it's probably the oldest neighborhood in the, in the county. Mm -hmm. It's not officially a historic district. There's a lot of historic homes and there's a lot of historic feel in there. Yeah. Are you saying that the legislature is going to say, ah, you're going to have to just treat it like everything else. You just can't. Pretty much. <laughs> oh, but if it's national, you're fine. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Um, we went through about, this you know, a little uh, bit. Uh, West, couple... Second Street. Second yeah. Street. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we discussed uh, this topic a little bit a couple months ago at this point. And, uh, well, I think there are two houses away of becoming qualified to get a, a district. So that may work for those. Okay. Yeah. The other ones, it's going to be a question mark. And uh, again, it's one of those things we're going to have to work our way through. Okay. Um, all right. Accessory dwelling units. That's one of those housing issues that uh, we need to never have, huh? <laughs> Uh, detached and internal is the way uh, things are going these days. Uh, state law changed a couple of years ago for those. For the internal ones, they have to be permitted uses. I think you've already done that. Um, at least I don't remember you didn't do it. So um, anyhow, uh, then the detached ones, 
There's no state law on that yet. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw one soon, but um, uh, how do you want to treat those? That's one of the questions. Uh, okay, transition standards. We, we felt like the buffering between more intense uses and less intense, we just need to have more of a conversation about that and make that more consistent and uh, hopefully more helpful to the less intense area. Um, and then we already talked about that last one, which is these little bits and pieces that are all over. We're going to put them into the right chapter. So, okay. I know that's a lot, um, but we have some more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. So next we have the outdoor signs. So a couple of recommendations that we wanted to highlight as we were going through the assessment process is just that the procedure should be very clearly defined, um, either in this chapter by itself or in a procedures chapter. That's something we can discuss later. Um, they sh this should also provide a very clear table of sign re regulations and types um, and make sure that it's very clear where those apply. Um, also removing any provisions that are based on content, that's something that we'll definitely have to clearly look at throughout this process, making sure that, you know, you can't regulate signs based on what is written on the sign or the content of the sign generally. So we need to remove any bits of that if they exist. Um, and then a couple of things that we wanted to highlight as items that we want to reach out and ask the public throughout this process is, um, again, I think John mentioned this earlier, how do we want to protect historic or iconic signs? Um, there are several in Ogden that are really special and that are very well known. Um, and how do we want to incorporate that protection into the ordinance? Um, and then there's a couple other items, you know, what types of signs do we want to distinguish? Um, so that again, can't be based on content, but that might help with the regulation process. Generally, if there are certain types of signs like um, you know, new development signs or parking signs or something of that nature that may be a little bit easier to regulate generally. And then next we have landmarks. So we generally heard from you know, staff and the public that they really like the landmarks ordinance as it's functioning. And so we don't wanna change it too much generally. Um, we do wanna make sure that this matches the organization of the rest of the UDC. So again, it's easy for people to understand. It's easy for people to find where the regulations are and how they apply. Yeah. Um, we do want to make sure that we're adding some additional clarity where needed. So some of that may be with procedures or with definitions. A couple of things that came up were clearly distinguishing between historic buildings, districts, and landmarks, because there's some different, you know, procedural items that might go with each of those different things or whatever it may be. So having a very clear and obvious definition is important. Um, and then including clear process charts as well, so that processes for these different um, types of regulations is very clear and obvious for people as well. And then some policy questions that we want to highlight are just, does the city want to encourage adaptive reuse? That's something that is, um, you know, kind of popular and could be a really good fit for the community. So is the landmarks ordinance generally encouraging that or is there something else that we can do and fit into the ordinance? Um, and do the current standards that uh, the city is using for historic rehabilitation make sense? Um, are there things that we want to change or should the city consider um, establishing a, its own guidelines for historic regulation or rehabilitation, sorry? And is there um, a will to distinguish between certain maintenance activities so that rehabilitation or remodeling versus standard maintenance activity might have different requirements associated with it in terms of going to the Landmarks Commission or going through certain processes. Yep. 
All right, and next we have landscaping. So this was something that came up with the public um, and I think something that people are generally really interested in. And so a couple of uh, recommendations to highlight is we wanna make sure that con we're consolidating landscape requirements so that they're easy to find as well. Um, as John mentioned, there are a couple kind of scattered throughout and we wanna make sure they're in a consistent place. So it's easier for people to know where they need to go. Um, we also wanna make sure that we're using tables, visuals, so that it's really easy for people to understand what regulations uh, apply where, and then also what those regulations look like or what they mean uh, in a really easy to digest diagram, like something like you see on, on the slide here. And something that's come up quite a bit um, is obviously, using water-wise landscaping techniques. And that's something we've already talked about quite a bit here. Um, and so something we wanna talk to residents about generally is what types of regular, or what types of landscaping they really like and would like to see more of and how we can balance water-wise landscaping techniques and make sure that regulations are very friendly to water-wise landscaping techniques. Um, and balancing that with the public's interest and desire for that type of design. Can I ask a question about that too? Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry to keep interrupting. No. Um, I think it was last year the state gave some incentives for flipping, you know, mm. turf grass in in the property, not not just on the strip. And uh, I wondered if if there's a way to reference those kind of things in in the code, or because I'm not sure how long they'll last. You know, I mean those those incentives, but but it certainly would be good if people were able to to, to learn about them as they were going through this. It seemed I, I just wondered how that would work. Yeah, the state and quite a few water districts are actually doing incentives to uh, change out your turf into some kind of zero escape thing. Um, one of the goals of this update, this ordinance would be that you have an approvable ordinance that works for that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it took us six months in Mill Creek to create one that worked for the water district down there. Um, uh, but I think there's lessons from that we can pull together for uh, you all too. And uh, I think it's an interesting piece of this. Uh, you know, people seem to want to do the zero escape, but it's costly. So, um, you know, it, it, having some incentives for that, I think become important, but you apparently have to have the ordinance that they will accept. So uh, we have to get there. It's another one. So, okay. okay. All right. And next we have parking. So a couple of major recommendations is again, um, gather and compare parking requirements as they exist throughout the current uh, uh, ordinances and make sure that they're again in a consolidated place so that they're easy to find. Um, we also want to make sure that there's an easy process for um, updating parking standards. Um, recently, the city did a really great parking study in the downtown area. So understanding the needs for parking downtown has helped to improve the standards there, um, but making sure that other places throughout the city are also having the right size of parking regulation generally. So figuring out what is overparked and what is underparked and how regulations can change spatially throughout the city is important. Um, and let's see what else. Oh, and reviewing buffer standards here for parking. So that's, um, there are some, you know, spaces where buffers, um, fencing or landscaping show up in the landscaping section or they'll show up in parking. And so we wanna just make sure that they're consistent and again, easy to find for people. Um, so a couple of policy questions are, you know, we've talked about EVs already um, tonight. So 
EV charging infrastructure? Where should that be in the city? Is there an interest in seeing more of it throughout the city in other places besides downtown? Um, do the current boundaries for the downtown parking requirements work well? Are there buffer areas between downtown and other um, intensity of uses around downtown that need to be thought about again? Again, the idea of over parking or under parking and where that exists throughout the city. Um, yeah. And then next we have lighting here. So uh, as John mentioned, kind of the idea of dark skies principles come up quite a bit throughout Utah and something that we're interested in asking the city um, is what their interest is in that and as well making sure that we're balancing the idea of dark skies with ensuring that there is an appropriate amount of light to provide safety for the community. So a couple of recommendations on lighting for uh, generally for the UDC are to make sure that they apply consistently throughout Ogden um, to make sure that um, they are generally functional. So this is a kind of a bit of the dark skies principle, making sure that there isn't um, too much light trespass between properties, et cetera. And that is just something that we can, you know, kind of clearly state in the lighting um, chapter section uh, in the UDC. And so that's something we'll also be going to the community with, um, trying to figure out what the level of interest in, is in that generally. All right, and then finally we have downtown. So um, as we've mentioned, you all have very recently updated the standards for downtown. And so we wanna make sure that we're maintaining the framework of the existing districts and we'll make some minor updates to ensure that there's consistency with the rest of the UDC. It's a beautiful picture. It is such a beautiful picture. We've been using that one a lot. <laughs> um, and then finally, and to go back to the question of uh, consistency and trying not to goof things up as, as we move forward, um, making sure that there are some consistent formatting decisions and uh, even language to ensure that as amendments happen in the future that we try to keep as consistent as possible. Um, so this is a special style guide, which um, is going, you know, being vetted very thoroughly at the moment, but this covers things like the general format, the pattern of titles and chapters and subsections, and then it also gets into items like capitalization and hyphenation and just making sure that there is a very high level of consistency throughout the drafting process and then into the future this will just stick stick with. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, the idea is to try to help improve predictability um, and consistency for the user and for staff. That was the answer to my question. So oh, thank excellent. you. Excellent. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, I I really do think all the consistent uh, chapter formats, etc., helps everything in the future. So uh, that you want to change. But uh, let's just talk about uh, a little bit more about the approach. Uh, for us, it's it's easy to think in terms of the grouping of uh, the chapters. How do we want to go about that? Um, initially. We're suggesting in module one, what I called the basics earlier. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you haven't gone through your general plan process yet. And these ones really won't change significantly in a general plan process. Um, these are the foundational things that uh, you all should have. Um, and um, uh, let's lightly mention noticing change this last year. Hopefully it's going to change again this year's legislature. Um, they made it very uh, expensive for communities to make ordinance changes. Um, and hopefully that's going to go back to the way it used to be uh, coming up uh, toward the end of March. Um, but these are really technical things here that we're suggesting in module one and hopefully uh, not controversial items 
just items we need to take care of and provide that state law kind of update to them. Um, we want to start that processing discussion, though, and not really finish it, though, till we get toward the end. So the second one, second module is the big one where we go through all the zone districts. Uh, that will take a long time, and it shows spring 2024. Um, so chapter by chapter, we'll go through that, all of it, okay? Uh, we want to start on the landscaping one in that point, too. And again, we're hoping that the noticing is all changed by the time we get to this. So um, then we come back to the subdivision ordinance again and do whatever cleanup we need there, uh, make sure the procedures make sense, all of that, all the supplementary regs, we talked about them, signs, landmarks, parking, all of that in module three, finalize the procedures in module four. And then, you know, there's a step at the end where we have to bring it back, the whole thing to you, right? And make sure all the references made sense to the different uh, chapters, uh, make sure everything seems consistent and uh, there is an adoption procedure at the very end there that uh, that'll in theory, not be very difficult because you've been through it all, right? But it, uh, it's still a step we'd have to take. Um, which also does mean repealing some other things, right? Because we're eliminating this chapter, that chapter, and putting them all in the unified development code. So uh, that happens at the end. Okay, and just a note for tomorrow's meeting in conflict with the mayor's debate, <laughs> uh, which obviously when we decided to tag along with this one, uh, we didn't, we weren't aware of that. Um, Maybe we should tag along with a mayor's debate. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> we might actually there's have some like people show up. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's plenty to choose from. Yeah, so tomorrow night we're doing a presentation on the process similar to what you've learned tonight. Not, not the same kind of detail. Um, and have some questions really for the public. Uh, part of that's in a phone poll as part of the uh, 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 nice presentation that we're doing. And then we're also going to have some poster boards up uh, with questions on them also. So um, with that, oh, and if you don't go to the mayor's thing, um, you know, I know you're all coming to the meeting tomorrow night, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, right. Okay, um, so uh, that, that QR code gets you to our website and gets you to the assessment. And... Um, we are looking for comments from you on the assessment. Uh, you may find the chapter by chapter appendix in there that uh, is lots of fun to wade through, but it's got comments for every single chapter um, and uh, kind of covers everything we've talked about tonight, really. So um, for us, I think that's it. Uh, we really appreciate your time. If there's other questions and comments, we're available to the for those, um, I know that if you have a specific question, I'll go to Brandon first and uh, just feel free to contact him and we'll try and help out with some answers, so. I have a question, but I know also Brandon Cooper wanted to make a few statements. So I'll invite you up, Brandon, if you'd like to come up. Um, but also, I'm just curious. I mean, this all sounds really great to me. I mean, organizing it more, consolidating, making it more simple. Um, but I guess I'm curious when you've gone through this process before, have there been any negative feedback in the end about the product? You know, like, is there something that people are like, oh, this one thing went missing or is there something, you know, that people get upset about? So um, having done this quite a few times now, um, you know, the one, I hate to keep going back to the state legislature, but it's like, by the, <laughs> well, time, it's okay, we don't like, have by the time you sort of wrap up one piece, they've made a change to another that right. affects what you've done. So that's a problem. Um, I think the, the basic things that uh, most communities struggle with is this funny little D word called density. Mm -hmm. Okay. Height. Um. Those seem to be the two that uh, just are a struggle for every place that I've been. Um, trying to think of anything else that comes up really consistently. Um, well, 
uh, historic design sometimes mm -hmm. is too. Uh, right. Heber is actually having a meeting right tonight uh, talking about their historic design standards. So uh, it, it's that's one that's maybe that sense. is tough too. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that there's a lot. Uh, but unfortunately, I will say that process takes a while, and there's always going to be more changes than you expect. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Any other questions, Brandon? Thanks for letting me um, jump in at the end. I just wanted to say uh, thank you. Thanks for, to the consultant team. Uh, thanks to Barton, Brandon, and Joe behind me. Um, what we've heard tonight is just a tip of the iceberg. I think this whole process is aptly named um, uh, laying the tracks for our future. And it really is going to be transformative uh, for the city of Ogden. In 2010, we started thinking um, really hard about changing our codes. Uh, it was, it was, we didn't get a lot of traction back then, um, but we knew we were facing an uphill challenge. Um, our general plan is a little over 20 years old. Some of our zoning codes and the things that we're talking about tonight go back to the fifties. Mm -hmm. And so um, they, they are a mess. Chickens. Yeah. Chickens probably and goats and cows back then, but we are really at the front end of a very exciting process. I know it doesn't feel like that tonight. Um, okay. One of the things that I heard was that we all value uh, transparency and public outreach. And so I just wanted to end this evening with a plea to you all that we need help. Um, so if you are a representative in a district or if you are at large, I think either way you have some really exciting opportunities to help us um, cast a broader net. And so we would um, invite you to think about things like town halls that you sponsor. We could potentially have either the consultants or staff come to town halls that you all put together um, in your districts or neighborhoods that we could um, come and do some outreach with. Um, engaging with some of the, the other meetings that we have and using your networks to broaden that net to people that you're associated with that may not have come otherwise. So we're constantly thinking about how we can broaden that net. People don't care about this until it impacts them. Um, and so we wanna just make sure that our net is wide and it's broad and we um, deal with it that way and you all can help us with that. So I just wanted to say thank you. Um, this is going to change the face of our community over the next um, couple of decades. It is important, very exciting, and we need your help to, to get people involved. Couldn't agree more. Um, I just want I, some full disclosure um, on my day job. So this is partially being funded by a, a grant that comes out of WFRC. Um, and including in my division or department that I work in, but I have no idea what's going on. So this is the first time I've even heard. I mean, I knew that you were, I knew we got it, but I didn't, I wasn't part of that um, scoping or anything. So I just wanted some full disclosure before, in case somebody comes back and says something. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your presentation. It's really helpful to me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other council business or anything for me? Happy Halloween. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it, to be honest. 61 days till Christmas. Uh, the only other thing is we only have a couple of you signed up for the holiday parade. Mm -hmm. So we need to make arrangements for the golf carts if you're going to be involved. So I'll check my calendar. So that's about a town. You have to reserve your golf cart if you're going to participate. Just let us know. I'll make a note. Yeah, we're going to have the youth council do that. Decorate it for us. Mm -hmm. It's the day after Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving. <laughs> it's the same every year. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Some of them out in town. It's right after the Santa Road, right? Yes. Got to know how to drive a golf cart. That's the only requirement. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay. I like that.